everyone, and welcome to our wrap-up series for the Occupier Insights Group for 2020. Uh, thank you for joining today. Really grateful that people could spend uh, an hour with us to, to go back over 2020, look at some of the things that we learned, and to look forward to 2021. So thank you for joining today. Uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to do a quick year in review, and uh, we're going to do it Pecha Kucha style, and it's the first time I've ever tried a Pecha Kucha, um, so really looking forward to trying that. I'm, I did it in picture style, so to keep it a bit entertaining. So looking forward to that. We're going to do a panel discussion. We've got a, a, uh, a world-class uh, panel today to talk through kind of what we've seen in 2020 and what we're, what we're looking forward to in 21. Um, and then we're going to do Q&A. So, so just a few bits of housekeeping for today. So um, the panelists, if you could go on mute uh, during the, the first part of the presentation, um, we'll then click over and um, everybody could come off mute once we get into the panel. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, all of our attendees, on the right side of the technology at uh, the platform, you'll see a chat button. If you just click on that chat button, ask the question in the chat, and I will uh, ask the questions during the panel discussion. So we've set aside time for Q&A, but really I see us doing kind of a Q&A intertwined with the panel discussion. So please feel free to ask any question that you might have. Um, we'll, we'll definitely take them and, and we'll make them part of the part of the event today. So the speakers, uh, my name is Adam Hoy. I look after uh, Worldwide Real Estate and Facilities or REF for GSK, and I'll be your facilitator today. We have Alan Bainbridge, who's the Director of Workplace and CRE for the BBC. Claudia Bastiani, who's the Director of Real Estate Services for MasterCard. And Darren O'Toole, who's the Executive Director of Engineering and the EMEA Facilities and Operations Lead for MSD, or Merck as it's known in the US. Uh, so thank you to all the speakers. Really looking forward to, uh, to hearing uh, from them today. Just a quick plug for some of the upcoming UK chapter events. Uh, there's a wrap-up event, Place Tech and Talent, uh, coming up on the 25th of November. Uh, in January 21, a topic that we'll touch on a little bit today, but deep diving into in January, flexible working, how to thrive, uh, not just survive. Uh, the annual predictions and re resolutions, the much anticipated, I think we'll hopefully have some great predictions in 21 uh, and possibly some new resolutions on what we've learned in 2020. And then a one-to-one -one with uh, Allison Rankin on February 3rd. I think the team's done a, a really great job with these one-to-one -one sessions over the course of the year, uh, really in-depth conversations with leaders across the UK. So looking forward to this one with Allison on February the 3rd. Um, just an, another quick note here uh, about the chapter. I know there's some of you on today that, that may not be members, uh, but would really encourage you to consider membership. I've been part of uh, Coordinate now for about 15 years, different chapters across the world. I think many, many uh, pieces of value I've found uh, from being a member. Clearly, these, these types of learning and collaboration events, I think it's been a bit of a different year in 2020, the way we've doing it, we're doing it, but a ton of learning events that, that are available. Um, Young leaders, I, I think uh, bringing your younger uh, members of team into Cornet and allowing them the chance to, to be with other young leaders. We've got a really great program and some great young leaders that are leading that program. So uh, uh, significant value there. And then the social events. I think t this year obviously hasn't been great with social events, but going forward, I think a key part of the, the value proposition of Cornet is really the socialization and the networking. Uh, I'm looking forward to 21, getting back into into to having some live uh, events and, and getting to, to, to network with everybody again. So really encourage everybody that may not be a member to be to become a member. I think there's a ton of value in, in the UK chapter of Cornet. Uh, a quick uh, thank you to all of our sponsors. We'll acknowledge them on the slides throughout the event. Clearly it's been a, um, a an interesting 2020. So thank you to all the sponsors for sticking with us. Uh, and thank you, of course, to everybody that's, that's helped put the wrap up sessions that we're doing uh, this month together. Um, clearly a lot of work going on in the background. Um, so thank you to everybody. Too, too many people probably to acknowledge, but thank you to everyone. Also a quick thank you to, to Sally, who's my co-pilot in the Occupier Insights group. Uh, she does the bulk of the work. I say co-pilot, she's really the pilot. So thank you to Sally for all the work that she's done uh, with this group. So with that said, um, my first attempt at a Pecha Kucha, so really uh, looking forward to giving this a shot. Uh, 20 images, 20 seconds. We thought it'd be perfect for 2020 just to kind of wrap up the year. 
and take a look at it uh, in, in a quick uh, formatted style. So 2020, I think if we look back New Year's 2020, if, if you would have said and told yourself some of the things that would happen in 2020, you probably wouldn't have believed yourself. I think it's been uh, obviously a very unique year, not only in our industry, in the UK, across the world, uh, for all of us. So uh, we wouldn't have known what was coming. I look back to, to predictions and resolutions in 2020, and I was uh, lucky enough to be part of the panel. I've displayed my predictions, and clearly I didn't get the the, the big things that were coming in 2020 correct, uh, as none of us did, I don't think. Um, but I was reflecting back on this. This was actually in person. We were all together. Uh, and. and uh, Times have changed, but but uh, we started the year and clearly didn't know what was coming and how 2020 would roll out. COVID-19 obviously started at the end of uh, 2019 and then started uh, coming east to west um, as we, we got into into late winter and early spring. Um, and I think for, for most of us that were uh, managing global teams, uh, I think there was obviously a lot of work going on in, in China in January uh, and in February, and the crisis teams popped up and immediately snapped into action. Um, we didn't see what was coming. A lot of us didn't see it coming uh, as it did across the rest of the world. Uh, getting into March here in the UK, went into to our first lockdown. Uh, and just reflecting back on my last day in the office <clears throat> in March, uh, thinking that I would be out for a couple of weeks, uh, and then it turned into what it's turned into. Uh, but clearly uh, a monumental event in terms of uh, the way that, that we handled the virus here in the UK uh, happened to us uh, back in March. Um, looking at Cornet and how we were adapting our style and kind of what we were doing, we had, I thought, a really phenomenal event planned for March, uh, looking at physical space as a performance enabler with, with a great panel that we were ready to, to have, and that got canceled. Canceled. And we were, we were debating right up to, to a week before the event, do we go forward with this event? We want this in-person event. How do we have this and really continue to bring value to our members? Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. And we quickly, as we know, shifted into, into the online experience. Um, and then we all started dealing with, with these uh, types of pandemic crisis stage maps that, that we all have now. Um, I think, you know, most companies had uh, crisis plans in place for different things, but these really got tested this year and spent a lot of time in, in the spring and early summer looking at our, our, our pandemic stage plan and, and looking at what level we're in in different countries around the world. Um, so I think a lot of us were staring at these types of charts uh, throughout the year and we continue to as we look forward. Um, Looking at the office and the way that we're interacting with each other, I think the term social distancing, I, I'm not sure I ever heard it before 2020, to be honest, but it, it became a, a, a part of our vocabulary and it will be, I think, probably from here out. But if you think about what the industry started doing and really snap to it very quickly. How do we keep our offices and our workplaces safe? How do we get people in, make them productive, keep them productive, but also keep them safe at the same time? Many debates around masks, wearing masks in the office place, that's still what's going on today. But I think the industry really uh, proved uh, very valuable in quickly snapping to get um, these things in place then looking at the amount of information that started coming out late spring, early summer. These are just a few snapshots of some of the events that were put together. I was really astonished by the corporate real estate industry and how quickly the information started coming and we started having opinions and started looking forward to not only how we were dealing with the crisis at the time, but looking forward to what, what we could do going forward. How do we turn this into an opportunity? How do we learn and quickly adapt? Um, the, the Occupier Insights Group, as you see on the bottom the bottom right here, we, we had two events um, throughout the year just to bring people together to have open conversations about what we were seeing and what we were dealing with. So really impressive that the industry um, kind of got into this mode of, of moving forward very quickly. Then we started seeing all of this thought leadership pop up and, and it was it was almost too much at one point. We were getting all kinds of thought leadership around what was going on, what was next, et cetera. So we had real estate industry, property consultants, academic papers, mainstream media, all hitting us at the same time. And for uh, those occupiers that are on the call now, I, I know 
we were all in a similar spot where our senior leaders were asking us, you know, what to do next? What are we learning? How are we positioning ourselves? What is the market doing? Uh, and we really counted on a lot of this uh, thought leadership that was coming to us. Case studies, we've got some great people on my team that, that are keeping up with the different case studies and what people are doing and companies are doing. You know, we heard a lot of uh, CEOs come out in, in late spring, early summer uh, with, with declarations of getting rid of 20, 30, 40, 50% of their property portfolio. Uh, companies that were really looking to to um, move their culture agenda forward, um, looking to take advantage of, of people working from home to, to really turn the knob on the flexible working environment and use that as a cultural enabler, as we saw with Novartis and others um, in, in the way that they, they position themselves. So a lot of companies doing different things at the time. We then got into to the summertime, and I put summer holidays up here, but I think summer holidays, as we know, are a bit different this year for, for, for most people. And for me and others, that I'm sure, that have small children at home, the real summer holiday came when we got to back to school. So August, September time, um, the kids going back into school, uh, I think, created a different dynamic for a lot of us that had the opportunities to work at home with small children. Um, but yeah, it was definitely an interesting summer holiday and back to school period this year. We got into the fall and autumn time and, and we started to, to experience more of these, these um, virtual online conference type events. Cornet had its first uh, virtual summit, uh, the EMEA Live event that was meant to take place in Berlin in September. I thought a really good event. Content was was uh, was really strong. Um, the virtual experience um, was different than other types of virtual experience. So I think a really good event, and that went into the to the to the global event that that was held in North America. But this is what we were seeing in 2020. These types of ways of working. Clearly, we're all familiar with Zoom, Teams whatever platform we're using. So the, the diagram on the left here become a constant way of working day to day. We're seeing a lot of virtual happy hours, things like um, bringing teams together, team building events. And I know many of us are planning on Christmas time, how we're gonna bring teams together and, and continue to team build. Um, so not ideal, but something that we're dealing with uh, here in 2020. Then we got into uh, the autumn and cases starting to spike. And as we know, we're in the second lockdown here in the UK. Um, and it's something that we're dealing with a little bit not as severe as the first lockdown, as we know. Um, so yeah, something that, that we've dealt with and, and, and we're working on, uh, but, but um, something not quite the same in the same format as, as we saw in March. Then the presidential election as an American, I couldn't go through a presentation about 2020 and not mention it. I think it will have an impact uh, on, on our industry and obviously on the economy going forward. Um, I think the best part is that we'll have it behind us soon, uh, but obviously a monumental event and part of 2020 for all of us. Uh, then a lot of hope coming out recently. Um, so fellow pharma companies, Pfizer, Moderna, announcing that that their vaccines are starting to to, um, to read out very positively, 95% efficacy uh, on the vaccines. And we're getting information about uh, them possibly being uh, approved for emergency use and out on the marketplace uh, for for um, certain folks by the end of the year, which is fantastic news. Uh, bottom uh, graphic showing the other vaccines that are in the pipeline. Uh, we've got uh, some partnerships that we hope are gonna be coming uh, through soon. So I think we're all rooting for, for vaccines to hit the marketplace, as many of them as possible, so that we can move through this period as quickly as possible. Brexit, obviously on the minds of a lot of us, um, it's kind of taken a back seat to a lot of um, work that we've been doing, but clearly still something that's um, out there and something that we need to deal with as an industry. And then 2021, so we're not quite there yet, but I think that the light's at the end of the tunnel uh, getting to 21. Um, you know, uh, there were some good things that happened in 2020, but I, I don't think there's going to be many of us that missed uh, the year of 2020. So really looking forward to, to 2021. So I guess the question now is, how do we learn from what we saw in 2020? How do we grow and how do we take those, those learnings and really turn them into positives into the future? I think we've got a great panel here today to talk a little bit about some of these elements, some of these things that we've learned. Um, as I mentioned, Alan uh, from the BBC, Claudia from MasterCard, and Darren from MSD and Merck. And if I could invite the panel to, to turn on their cameras, um, We'll get into some of the Q&A and, and discussion part of the session. So welcome, everybody. Thanks again for, for joining and being part of the panel. Um, 
as we've seen and as we know, 2020 was a, new, a unique year across the world and certainly in our industry. Um, so really interested in some of your thoughts and some of the questions. And as I said, uh, please ask any question that you'd like in the chat section. Looks good that we're starting to get some some questions already, so thank you. But please uh, ask any question you like, and we'll weave them into into this session today. So Claudia, I thought I'd start with you. Uh, welcome, uh, and again, thank you for joining. I thought I'd start with you in terms of um, the industry that you're in. I think, as I mentioned during the open, we saw a lot from financial services companies during late spring, early summer, I would say, with regard to what they were thinking with regard to their portfolio. But just wondering from your vantage point, are you seeing any um, monumental changes, maybe not necessarily with MasterCard, but just generally in the financial services areas with regard to portfolio shape and size going forward? Yeah, so thank you, Adam, and thank you for your slides. They were, they were very interesting and resonated actually with me. Um, look, I think change is inevitable, but but you know, what is the change? So if we just think about the headlines, there have been um, different CEOs, you know, one has said, we don't need a central London HQ. Another has said, we want everyone back in the office. Another has said, we'll let the people decide. So, you know, it's certainly not aligned across the financial services industry. Uh, so I would say in that industry, probably there'll be um, a reduction in footprint at some point, but just to, just to really broaden the conversation a little bit around other industries. I mean, the technology industry, it's a different type of industry. So it's much um, faster growing in the last 10 years, say. So there's certainly a desire to build and continue to invest in strategic growth. So, you know, we've seen people like Google investing in their portfolio. Um, MasterCard certainly are still looking at their strategic um, growth. So therefore, places such as Dublin, we are continuing with our strategy in Dublin and growth and investing heavily in our portfolio there. So um, other industries talking about hybrid models uh, might work for some, might not work for others. But one thing we can all agree on is that whilst the footprints might contract a little bit, certainly our spaces, the focus is very much on the human experience. So, so for me, the biggest change will be um, about focusing on how we design and operate our spaces with the humans and with human experience in mind. Yeah, I, yeah very fair. I think um, a lot of us are looking at it the same way. So um, yeah, I appreciate it. And I think the learnings that we could take from different industries, we will certainly see go across, um, certainly into, into other areas of the market too. Um, so Alan, um, your your portfolio is interesting in looking at the different types of space that, that you look after and um, the use of the space. Clearly, as we've gone through this time, uh, we're still broadcasting, we're still seeing news, we're still seeing people in, in newsrooms, you know, maybe it's a little different profile, but um, can you talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the type of properties you're looking after and maybe some of the different strategies you've had as you've gone through this this pandemic time? Yeah, sure. It, it's I, I, I'd agree with uh, Claudia, and and I think what COVID has done, I think it's accelerated, uh, amplified, uh, um, brought forward things which were already there and already being considered by people. I think so. The work that we've done, um, we've got a very very mixed portfolio. Um, and the most recent work we did was was on our project in Cardiff, which was to to look at the workforce and realise that the workforce is is widening in its age profile, in its diversity, um, in our understanding of of well being for an individual and how to get the best out of people in the workspace. So it's about productivity. It's about people bringing their, their whole selves to work and the building and the facilities not restricting that contribution because that, that's an asset that the, that the company has and we, it's really, really important for everyone to feel and contribute as much as they can. So we did an awful lot of work about texture, colour, sound, uh, neurodiversity, trying to make the space as, as accommodating and to support as many people as possible. And what's been really interesting in COVID is a those buildings which were re able to adapt virtually overnight to the, the restrictions and the new ways of working and equally those buildings that we as we start to look to the future those which are going to be able to adapt 
quickly for the long term as well. So as Claudia says, the new offering will be a very wide and varied offering for a, a, a range of uses, which that's what we'd already done in Cardiff. So that, as I said, the learning is, is it's, it's speeded up something which was already, which is already there. And obviously I think those buildings which were least able to adapt are the ones which have long-term problems or challenges, one uh, one phrase. Um, so it's all about the, the human experience and how you can support people, because I think that is that is the learning in this. This is an interesting now. I've been on several of these conversations. We don't tend to talk about net internal area and lettable <coughs> space and all those all those currencies that were previously used to describe good real estate. I think have possibly gone out the window now, and we need a new set of currencies to describe good and less good. Yeah, so I think that's a great point. You know, one of the things I was talking about with, with our team not too long ago is I think the general uh, way of working in the past was you did studies based upon how many people were coming in and, and then you modified your real estate portfolio over time. And it took a bit of time to go through that cycle. How many people are coming in? How are you utilizing? Do you have excess space? And now it seems like we're kind of skipping to the end a bit, right? Where we're looking at, you know, do we need to do all these studies? We know we need less space. So let's just skip to the end point where we're really designing for what we think we need, um, which I think is, is an interesting advancement. Um, Darren, uh, coming to you, one of the things that that I noticed about Merck MSD um, throughout this process, and and um, we were on, a, or you you were actually speaking as part of a um, a panel uh, a while back, was the the work that yeah. that you've done um, in putting together a, a pandemic readiness. Uh, set of documents and guideline, and I was super impressed with what you had done. Uh, and looks like technology may have gotten the best of Darren right while right while I was asking him a question. Uh, let's see if he's back. Well, let me keep uh, talking Darren up while he's he's uh, rejoining. So I was I was really impressed with the the work that that Merck at MSD had done in terms of getting ready for uh, the pandemic and and in asking different people across the industry who's best in class in terms of being ready for something like this. And, and Merck was, was the company that came up quite a bit. Um, so I was really interested in hearing Darren speak at an event where they talked a little bit about how they were ready for the pandemic. Okay. And Darren, I think you're back now, uh, but I, I've been talking you up uh, while you're gone. So just maybe, um, can you talk a little bit about, um, yes. uh, you know, your preparedness <laughs> and what you, what your thoughts were when, when the pandemic hit and, you know how ready were you, and and how did it how did it work out in terms of the planning yeah. that you did? Yeah. Okay. Um, I I understand. There's a bit of a delay in my um, in my voice, so um, hopefully people can hear me. Um, somebody nod if you can. That would help me to make sure that I'm not just warbling on endlessly um, or aimlessly. I should say. Perfect. Right. So yes, we we had um, we had a playbook a pandemic. Um, epidemic um, handbook or, or playbook and um, I think you know it was highly effective um, and there's a couple of different reasons why I would say it was highly effective the, the first one is it was good good to start with and what do I mean with, by that I mean it actually contained relevant and useful information. Um, so it, it, it had within it uh, Cumber, so, uh, so Darren, the uh, Darren points and advice around the facility and the work um, of a facility event of a of a pandemic, you know things like physical distancing. You know, who set up things where people not only the staff of uh, the workplace, not only about action, PPE, face masks. Yeah, so unfair. Uh, unfortunately, I think Darren's breaking up a bit. So Darren, um, let me come back to you in a bit. 
um, because we're having a little bit of trouble understanding. Uh, yeah, so that would be great. So thank you. Um, and again, technology, one of the things that we're dealing with here in 2020, I think the bandwidth that all of us uh, have in our homes is really being tested. I've called a few different cable provi internet providers myself. Um, so I, I think we're getting some really good questions in the Q&A and I thought I'd just look over at that quickly to see if, um, to see if we could um, look at any of those quickly before we get back into the into the main questions good to see some some old friends popping up on on this on this list tommy uh, good to, to hear from you i will definitely recalibrate my predictions for 2021 i'm not willing to do that live today but i think they'll be different for 21 as than they were in 20 uh, for sure um, anoop uh, good to hear from you our occupiers now looking for different skill set from the partners less transactional more strategic and data centric um, so i'll I'll, I'll take a crack at that one and then maybe pass over to Claudia or Alan or both if, you, if you'd like to answer as well. I think for me, um, I think I've always been looking for strategic partners, to be honest. Um, you know, you need the transactional bit, but you really look at, at your partners as as the people that can deliver and give you that strategy and that insight and that 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 proactiveness that really helps you bring that competitive edge to your company. Um, so I think for me, um, that hasn't changed. And I think maybe the types of skill sets might be a little bit different now, given that, that the, 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 the type of space that we're probably going to be occupying is going to change over time. So I think we've always looked for strategic um, skill sets and, and strategic elements of, of our relationships with our partners. But what we're, what we're looking for in terms of specifics might change. So Claudia, Alan, interested in, in, in your thoughts on that one. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I'll, I'll take this one first, if I may. Um, I certainly think, look, I'm going to talk again about spaces and designer spaces, if I may. So my role at MasterCard is to run our capital projects in EMEA. And certainly in the future, I think there's going to be um, more of a focus on neuroscience and psychology and positive environmental psychology across all industries when it comes to designing workspaces. So certainly our current partners uh, whilst a, a lot of our current partners offer these sorts of services now, I think that's an area of growth. And I think, um, and this is an area that will be, that will really create value for all of us as corporate occupiers um, across the board. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly I do think that we'll be looking at a different skill set. I still think we will need the um, baseline skill set because at the end of the day, we have portfolios to run and manage and all the activities that happen as part of as part of that normal life cycle yeah I'd, I'd say um two three things here one is I, I mean people talk about the office sector going through its retail moment the change in use and and business i, I i've started to think it's more like the car industry you swapping from petrol to electric and the way you buy a car, the way you own a car, how you think about a car is is changing at a dramatic speed. So in the same way, I think the, 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 the engagement between us and the supply partners has changed. It has changed now, whether, whether people realize it or not. And I think when we look as portfolio owners, managers, we are looking for something that supports the business in a real and very different way. As a, and, and some people will be going through a period now of, of strain with a huge cost going out the door that does nothing for them. Um, so that psychologically, that's altered the relationship even if, even if these other things haven't. And I think the other thing to, to understand as well for an organization to have its entire workforce, and I mean entire workforce from people who joined the organization four weeks ago, right the way to the CEO, all catapulted into the same change at the same time, makes for a very different demand. It's not your market's changed. It's not that your regulatory framework has changed, so therefore your business has to change change your whole workforce has just changed and has now decided it wants something different it's just been it's just had some of it for one year by the time we get out of this so for one year they've lived in a different way it's it's 
quite phenomenal the human behavior change i think and that it will be psychologists really good quality designers and engineers who will be able to give the answers to that uh to deliver value and which is what you know real estate has to deliver value it's a very expensive commodity yeah yeah really good points i agree i think it, it'll also be interesting to see what the commercial arrangements look like going forward because i think those will shift as well um all right darren i see that you're yes. back uh, and you've whet the appetite of everybody on your pandemic playbooks <laughs> and you've created quite an atmosphere of suspense so over to you to, to continue you. talking about the, the great work that you've been doing in that space okay thank you so um so i, I kind of start from the beginning again so yeah, we, we had a playbook. Um, the first thing about it, why was it so effective? I think the first thing is that it was it was actually useful. Um, so the information in the playbook was incredibly useful for the organization. You know, it contained um, information around our facility, um, environmental work controls. It gave advice on physical distancing and social distancing, uh, hygiene, um, disinfecting the workplace, PPE, how to respond to an illness in the event that it happened. And then things like external work environment, where our field force are out and about working. You know, how advice. The second thing, we were organized very well. Um, so our senior executive crisis team had um, each operating unit on it. It also had, we all work in matrix organizations and they bring their own complexities. But the, uh, the organization at, a, at the senior level, it included each of the operating units plus the shared functions um, and all of the um, support areas were also represented. And then that, that organization was mimicked on the ground. So at a, a site level, at a manufacturing site, um, the, um, we set up at a country level and at a site level uh, an incident management team. And this is part of our standard process, and I'm sure it's similar for yourselves, but the organization was replicated. So the pandemic handbook and the, and the guidance within it was pushed straight through each of the matrix organizations in a consistent fashion through to the line management responsibility within each, each incident management team as well. So it was consistency of messaging. And I think that made it immediately impactful. And then we kept the information up to date. So we used questions and answers to be able to um, inform um, the uh, and adjust the guidance that was contained. And we also used science-based uh, guidance. So as you, as you know, there was an awful amount of in, incredibly um, crazy theories around how to uh, help, including injecting bleach into your blood, if we seem to remember one particular um, uh, politician seemed to suggest that that might be a clever idea. So, you know, there was an awful amount of uh, non-scientific based information. So we were able to use our processes to get consistent scientific based information out globally, quickly. Um, and that worked. Uh, I heard a question and a conversation around our service partners. So the service partners were integrated into this process as well. So for them, this helped as well because it was one consistent message one consistent way of organizing and controlling and then the communication lines uh were, were really clear and really effective as well um so you know i think they're the kind of four things it was good advice we were organized effectively um we kept the information up to date using science and we communicated uh, incredibly well um so yes it worked thankfully it worked really well for us yeah thank you for that darren i think really interesting um and and you know i reflect on how we used our playbooks and it we we had i think good learnings throughout and we adapted quickly but but msd clearly uh, was one of the ones that that was that was called out early um so so it's a really good to hear that that it worked maybe i uh, just take a question from the q a uh for the panel um so matt thank you for the question um do you see this as a watershed moment for cre hr tech CRE, HR, and tech working together. And we've got a couple of these uh, as well. And I think this is a common theme that comes up during different Cornet events. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I think, you know, over time, you would think that the answer is yes, but really interested in, in any of the panel, Alan, Claudia, Darren, um, do you think this is a watershed moment in terms of those three, those three organizations working together? I, I would say yes. Um, I, for our organization, 
um, I'm having more conversations and aligned conversations with HR and technology than than I've ever had. It's um, I, th I think again, all three of us were catapulted into the same situation. You know, the tech guys were immediately keeping everybody working remotely. You know, we're a very heavily based high tech organization inside the real estate. Um, and we were all of a sudden broadcasting from people's bedrooms and kitchen tables. Um, so all of a sudden they sort of entered my world in <laughs> remote working and then HR have to be there for everyone's well-being and support. So by default, we were thrown into the same room together and we're now using that as a, as a relationship plan going forward. And again, that was something that was desperately needed before COVID ever happened. But for all sorts of reasons, it was too difficult, apparently, to, to solve that. But I would say definitely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think certainly to, to echo what you're saying, really. Um, I mean, looking forwards, I think what we've all learned is that, uh, and, and this is a good learning, that our finance guys um, across the board, for once, are actually really listening to and wondering about um, how people are feeling in their offices and what uh, and the impact of being in the office, what it what it is on the employees. So what's the employee value to go to the office, and actually, what's the enterprise value of having that employee in the office? So, so yes, when we talk about workplace strategy and designing workplaces, of course, there's an interplay between technology, HR, real estate. But I think going forwards, it's going to be even more important and. And another thing, of course, we've got a much more informed workforce now than we did have a year ago. OK, yeah. so everyone is so much more clued up about health and well-being, air quality, their mental health. Everyone's much more aware. So, so it goes without saying that this um, this, look, this is good. This is this is good for us in this industry. You know, but once everyone's challenge. listening, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, fully agree. Um, OK. In, in our world is advocating um, not coming back to the office. I see some of the questions about a lot of employees want to come back to the office. Mm -hmm. they, they most definitely do. Yeah. I'm not sure there are that many who want to do the Monday to Friday, two hour commute each way, yeah. every day of the week, and be given a desk and a, and a fixed PC <laughs> for the rest of their life. I, I can't imagine there are many who want, there will be some, there will yeah. be some, but there won't be many. No, I think that's fair. And what's interesting is we've had a couple of these events over the course of the year. And the first one was closer to the beginning. And I think what we've seen, and I'm sure everybody's seen the same thing, the, the feedback that you see on surveys, you know, some of it's pretty consistent around exactly what you said, Alan. Um, you know, working from home a couple of days a week, I think is pretty consistent. They probably said that before, if people were honest. Um, but clearly, you know, the the amount of people that do want to get back into the office has certainly grown over the last couple of months, which is which is understandable. So, Darren, uh, maybe try to, to to give you a question here, uh, seeing how your your connection is working. Uh, Christina asks a, a really interesting question about employee well-being and the changing stresses of the pandemic um, are we are you seeing any changes or anything noticeable at least in terms of absence rates uh, pre or post maybe harder to tell but uh, given the fact that that you've kind of had this plan in place and you've been tweaking have you seen anything with regard to employee absence over the course of the course of the year um, I, I would say it, it's actually quite interesting um, I think our biggest problem, I know, I know the question is specifically around employee absence, but, but let me just twil tilt, twil tilt a little bit for just one second. One of our biggest difficulties has been to get people to take time off, to legitimately take down time. Um, and and um, I think that that actually rolls into the question on, on absence. It's really difficult to, to measure. Um, because, you know, it, 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 we're not in an environment where you can physically see people, you know, um, people could quite easily be away for a couple of hours or a day or two and, and actually be nearly missing. So it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to keep track of all of our employees. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact, and I think, you know, everybody on, on this call will, will, will understand that, that there is beginning to be more and more a significant concern around general well-being for, for our employees. Um, and I think that's why it's really important that we find a way to get back together 
um, <clears throat> you know, to get that sense of connection. And I think that's an important thing for us as a as a as a as a as a functioning group um, um, to support. Um, and you know, I think um, the the questions around me mental health are are becoming particularly as we get into those dark long months of winter. So Darren, I think you faded off right when you said dark, long months of winter, which was um, kind of odd. So um, thank you for that. Fully agree, Darren. I think those are- see it in every single person that I speak to, that there is a, um, a good day and a bad So Darren, um, yeah, so we're having a, a few more issues with your with your connection. Um, maybe just maybe just moving on um, and, and fully agree. I think um, study. Thank you for the question. Good to hear from you. I think a very interesting question about presenteeism, and I think this is something that you know for those of us that have look, been looking at agile type organizations, flexible organizations um, over the past ten plus years. One of the questions and comments that always comes up is presenteeism, and and are people being judged by being in the office, having FaceTime with people. I think there's more progressive organizations that have gotten past it and have really gone on to outcome-based metrics and outcome-based um, uh, performance plans and, and goals and objectives. But but openly, there's still a lot of companies that aren't like that, that haven't evolved to that to that point. Um, but uh, Claudia, maybe I'll, I'll ask you this question. Um, any thoughts on, on that in terms of how we move forward? Do you think companies will be more open to flexible working, less open? Do you still see, see presenteeism, the traditional, somebody's got to be in the office nine to five do you see that as an issue not really personally so I think so again um even pre-pandemic you know what most high performing companies have um operate in in a way where presenteeism doesn't really doesn't really feature anyway just by nature of the work that they do and how their how their workforce are working now um, so I don't personally think that that's going to be an issue. Certainly there are some more traditional organisations and in time, you know, they will change. And that's just part of the evolution of the workplace, I would, I would suggest. Yeah, yeah, fair point, fair point. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, good question. Uh, thank you for that, Study. Um, Guy, uh, thank you for the questions and, and good to hear from you as well. Um, Looking at Guy's questions, uh, where you work is not a binary question, home versus office, but also should include remote or closer to home working. Do we agree? Um, so, so Alan, maybe I'll come to you. And then secondly, um, how do we go about addressing this? So more offices, you know, things like hub locations and flex working spaces closer to where, you know, concentrations are where people are living. Any thoughts on how that, that, that will develop? I, I think that, again, back to my earlier point, because a lot of this change is going to come from the staff themselves, I think that will be a question that many of them will ask or demand or request. Um, I know we are looking at our whole distribution as to where where our workforce lives, what their commute journey is, environmental and a hub and spoke uh, arrangement, and where traditionally you may have been based at, at a, one of the larger centers, you do have local centers near you, but because pre-COVID you didn't do the function at that local center, mm -hmm. it might be, it can support one of those things that you are looking for when you're not working from home. So you could go to that local center. Mm -hmm. It's a complete, it, it, it's a completely different way of looking at the portfolio, but it's not really, it's, it's just having a, uh, using your data in a human way as opposed to a real estate or a, a technology way so starting to connect the two and and, yeah. and we had because we already had the technology it's sort of it we've sort of tweaked what we already had a bit or we're working it harder shall i say i think some organizations will have invested heavily in remote working technology so why that it's going to be a hard push to say, well, just put it all in the bin now and then move back to the office. You know, there's going to be yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a, uh, an easy conversation to have. And yeah. then that leads to, well, one day a week, I might go here, which is a much shorter, much easier commute. But the environmental agenda hasn't gone away. It hasn't gone away in that we've been dis producing and consuming amounts of disposable 
product that we would never have wished to do. We'd all, we'd all just got that down and now we've been doing that because of COVID. We'll go straight yeah. back to trying to look after the environment the best way we can. And this is commuting must be one of them and working locally. Yeah, for sure. I think it's interesting. Just a quick thought uh, for myself on this one, as it's something that we discuss. I think the interesting part about close to home working and hubs that could be close to home um, is really diving in to understand what the needs of the, the people are. So do, do you, are you putting those hubs close to people's residents because they're not effective at home? Um, or is it because you have actual teams that may be able to get together in hubs? I think that the challenge I've always had with a hub near somebody's house is, are you gonna go to that hub and work independently for the day? Or are you actually going into an office to work with other people? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's. I think it, it could be company or industry specific in, in that uh, maybe some people just can't work effectively at home. You have a concentration like that in, in maybe uh, an urban location and you wanna get people out of smaller flats and then they come into a location, uh, but maybe it doesn't work in other areas. So I think an interesting question and something that will definitely be part of the portfolio as we move forward, uh, but probably in different ways for different companies, I would say. Um, okay, so one of the things I like to do, I wanna make sure we get this question in and if we have any other time, we could come back to some of the others possibly. But really looking at what we've learned, if you could talk about the one thing that you've learned in 2020 and how you're gonna take that forward into to 21. So Claudia, I'll start with you and then go around to the others for some thoughts. Uh, this is a really hard question because I've learned a lot in 2020. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think I've been reading some of the questions in the chat, actually. I think that the main thing I've learned, and I think that we've all, if we just stop, this pandemic's been such a great leveler, hasn't it? And it's given us all time to stop and think and question what we're doing, what we're doing in our work, why we're doing it, and the same in our lives too. And I just think that it's too early to call out exactly what you think your, your own organisation is going to need because I think we need to let the next couple of years play out personally. So of course, we're all being very smart anyway and looking at our portfolios and looking at all of the smart asset management opportunities. So we should continue to do that. The great news is now we're all far more prepared for the future if um, we have another similar situation or a local epidemic or whatever that might be. Um, but certainly, you know, we cannot predict accurately how our people are gonna behave. We can, we, we can continue to ask questions and try to predict the future of work for our own organisations. So I know that MasterCard are doing a lot of work in that space and, and, it's, and it's all good stuff. But I think ultimately where we're going to be in two or three years time, I think it's quite early to make that call now. I think if you look to the industry, so we can look at our own organisations, we know what's going on. But I have to say, as an industry, I think we've all done a great job the last few months of keeping sane through this madness and actually <laughs> getting our offices safe for people who do want to go back into the offices. And, you know, it's, it's been hard work. So well done, everyone. Um, but I certainly think that it's it's too early to make the call on where this is all going to land. I mean, you look to the industry, there's, there's evidence out there now. Leesman have just published some great things lately about... Um, the correlation between high performing workplaces and the fact that people want to go back to those workplaces. They don't want to work from home four days a week. Yeah. That's no surprise, right? So, but, but we need to stop and think about this. There are different demographic groups. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that we still ourselves need to get a bit more educated on, clued up on. And I just urge everyone to share information um, and to share insights as much as you can. Um, I think, you know, I think that's a really important thing for us all. Yeah, yeah, fully agree. Alan, some thoughts from you? Um, I think there's two or three things. I think one, I, 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 and to build on what Claudia said, I think a quality, quality work environment, so a, a office facility, uh, whatever it is that you have, that's designed around the people the value in investing in a quality professional design has shone through i think during during COVID, and it will be what comes out post covid so quality real estate the value of it will be seen for what it's worth the difference is that's a quality around the workforce and the amenity which people want to come and use when not working from home 
that isn't necessarily a beautiful marble foyer with the most expensive objet d'art in it because that doesn't really do anything as I walk past it and it's my work environment where the quality and the, and the, the thought and design should go to. And another thing which I hope it's it's a, it's a thought I've had all along, but but I'm not, I'm not saying I'm Einstein or anything. But the facilities management component in a truly wonderful place to work has to come and join the real estate world. They're, they're too far apart, and they've had their moment now. And any, anybody I speak to in facilities management, I'm encouraging them to seize the moment because. That's the industry that kept, it's the industry that kept us on air. It's the industry that kept our buildings open and fit for purpose to broadcast. And that's an industry that now needs to come back in play for the, for the future. Because the next thing we have to do is to get ready for the next pandemic or, or whatever it is. So we, we've got to be ready. And I think facilities management in the real estate world needs to join up really, really closely and be valued and not be driven down by cost mm. is my it's it's a moment for people to stand up and be counted almost yeah so well said i i would echo that i think the the amount of focus and recognition that that our own fm team has gotten this year from senior executives has definitely been there and i think people's eyes are definitely opened that you can't just keep pushing costs down in that space no, that this is a it's, valuable it's a, part of the organization and really the backbone so i think that's really really well yeah. said darren uh, why don't we give give it a go uh, to see if uh, we can get some thoughts from you Thank you. Um, I, I completely agree with what um, Alan just said. Um, but, you know, if I was to say one thing um, for me, it's about how important the connection with people is. Um, and I would say not only is it vitally important from a mental health perspective, uh, from a, you know, driving collaboration, you know, across the across the enterprise, but actually it's incredibly efficient. Um, it's been horrendously inefficient to try and get anything done. Uh, you can up to a point, but there's an eventual point where you have to meet people. And Claudia, I heard that you're doing a lot of capital projects. I have an awful amount of capital projects happening in my region. And I haven't been to one site and I miss that. Um, I know I'm missing out on a huge amount by not being there. Not that I don't trust, but one day at a, at a site and I'll, I'll be able to, I know, <coughs> help a, a huge amount. Um, so I think for me, it's around that uh, connection with people. And I, and I fundamentally believe that providing um, workplaces that are uh, collaborative, um, that are flexible um, and can uh, change to suit the problem, the environment, the need um, is, 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 is vital uh, as we move forward. That hasn't changed when we went into the pandemic. This was important. When we come out of the pandemic, this will be um, important. And, and I completely agree if we build inspiring workplaces, uh, people will need to come to them and will want to come to them. So I think that's something that we need to focus on. So the first thing for me is the connection with people. Uh, that That's the, the big thing that, that I knew was important, but I really, really understand it now, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Yeah, I think well said, Darren. Um, you know, one of the things that that... I think we all probably are encouraging our our senior managers and and finance people around is uh, you know we've saved money on travel this year for sure and um, that's a good thing but we need to be careful on how much we're baking how much savings we're baking into future years because i think there's going to be that need to reconnect uh, with people and on our teams because we can't assume because we did this that it's every bit of it is going to work going forward so i think connection to people uh really really well said there and i think maybe one thing to add for me um is really the hyper care for people and teams. I think we've learned a lot on that over the course of this year and and maybe some of it we've taken for granted. But but the fact that we've had to find new ways to connect with people, find creative ways to connect with people, I think has been a, 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 a a powerful learning for myself and and i think you know for my organization i've seen a lot of it where senior leaders are being part of different meetings that they wouldn't have been part of before obviously we've said this in the past but the the 
the lack of formality in some of the spaces when you see different office settings that you're sitting in, I think has really advanced um, the way that we're connecting with teams um, as much as we can given given the, the, the virtual setting. But for me, it's how do we take that learning and connected and hyper care of people and really advance that into, into the time where we do have more of a connected uh, virtual stroke uh, in-person uh, type of working relationship. So uh, I think a lot of great learnings from 2020. Uh, so with that said, uh, I think we were meant to go to 50 past the hour and, and we've gone a little bit long. Um, so I just want to thank the panelists today for their insight. Thank you for joining. Thank you for, for putting these things together. Darren, I think it, it worked out in the end. I think we heard a lot of the important bits that you were that you were bringing to, to, to the table. So thank you for that. I want to thank all the participants. Thank you for your questions. The, uh, the attendees, thank you for your questions. Um, again, uh, thank you to Coordinate and the people that have helped put this session together. Um, I think it's the organization has really grown and done a nice job of, of remaining um, in a position to, to bring content to people even in this even in this remote environment. So really looking forward to, to seeing everybody live next year at some point. Um, have a really good holiday period. Hopefully everybody gets some rests uh, and everyone's looking forward to 2021. So thank you all. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.